Olá, a IUPAP, International Union for Pure and Applied Physics, está interessada em muitas coisas. Dentre elas, a definição das unidades básicas que nós usamos no dia a dia, a manutenção das constantes fundamentais, mas também está muito interessada nos desafios que a ciência tem atualmente. Na área da física são muitos os desafios. Nós temos desafios desde o entendimento das partículas elementares, da matéria condensada, na física nuclear, é, na biofísica, na astrofísica. Em todas as áreas, ou sub-áreas da física, nós temos desafios. Para que você saiba quais são esses desafios, a IUPAP organizou um workshop especial que chama-se Entendendo os Desafios da Física Moderna. Cada área da física está aqui é, sendo apresentada por um líder, membro da IUPAP, e que você terá então agora a chance de entender, através desta apresentação, os desafios que a área apresenta e como os físicos, de um modo geral, estão superando esses desafios para que a física seja um instrumento de entendimento das ciências naturais e que auxilie o homem não apenas a avançar o seu conhecimento, mas a tornar a ciência um instrumento útil da melhoria de vida de cada um existente nesse planeta e nesse universo. Assista e também faça parte do entendimento dos desafios da física moderna. Boa sorte! Okay, so uh, welcome to our workshop. As I explained uh, before, this workshop um, has the aim to transmit the challenges and the good things that has been done in each of the field of physics. That's why we invite uh, each chair of each commission of IOPAP to Uh, present uh, an overall idea about the field and some relevant work. Uh, every day, we have a workshop for three days. Every day, we start the workshop with a special talk. So today, we have Bill Phillips. Tomorrow, we have Dave New Island. And on Friday, we have uh, Mark Raisin and uh, Robin Kaiser. And they all should speak about uh, exciting fields that somehow is correlated to many of the commissions. Now, except for the first talks, uh, the, which are one hour, the others are 25 minutes. Okay? And uh, we should try to keep the time, otherwise we're going to get uh, tired. And I will be behind there. So I was going to cut the microphone after the time, but uh, Bill told me that, that that's not nice. We are all friends, and we all understand the importance to be precise. I know that 25 minutes is nothing if you have a lot to say. And it's infinite if you have... No, it is nothing if you have a lot to say. It is infinite if you have nothing to say. But, uh, you know, being a chair of a commission, I, I, I guess you have a lot to say. I know it's not enough time. But uh, part of being a good scientist is being able to say precisely what you want in the time or in the space available. So I, I hope then we're not going to cut the microphone. I go there, I'll be behind, and I'll say 10 minutes, you know, like marching around. And then five minutes, and you try to control yourself because uh, we would like to have a, a, a collection of nice talks. 
concerning chair in the section, the last speaker of each period of each section will be the chair of the next. So uh, I will chair this because somebody has to start. But then Peter Moore from NIST, Peter, he is giving the last talk before the coffee break, so he will chair the next. Uh, Professor Reining Gu. So you'll be giving the last talk tomorrow before the cough, so you are chairing the next. Eagle. Eagle. So she'll be giving the last talk today, so you chair the talk tomorrow that starts with David New Island. So very simple rules. Okay, now, all the talks is being broadcast online. So if you have any problem with that, you don't want your image to be abroad, tell me before, because we're going to put a black transparency. Okay? We are recording, and that will be a collection. We're going to make an edition. You know, like, just say the right stuff and without uh, intervals of nothing. And that will be available in the home page. But uh, today we announce, and I think there are a lot of people already trying to link or already link it. This is the address. Because, of course, this is a room for 200 people, but uh, we can reach much more if we announce web seminar the way we did. And maybe many people will be looking some of the seminars. So if nobody manifests, I assume that everybody is giving the permission to be broadcast. Okay, so, oh, and finally, uh, <clears throat> tomorrow is a holiday here in Brazil, and I don't know how many taxis will be available from here to the city. It will be easier to get a taxi in the hotel but if during the afternoon you, you know, you tire, jack leg and things, you want to go back. I think I advise you to, there are some numbers that you call and they come to get you. The hotel has a very nice number, which I don't know out of my head, but you can ask them to give the taxi number. And then you can call or we can call for you if you desire, okay? So, I guess I said everything. Maitri, is there anything else? Okay. So, we're going to start. And the first talk will be given by Bill Phillips. Everybody knows Bill Phillips. So, uh, he works for a long time in Code Adams. He has a nice group at NIST in Gatesburg. And um, he got a few prizes in his life. And... He is a very nice person to the IUPAP. He's being enthusiastic for many things. And uh, there is this field of code atoms that is a kind of now interface between many other fields. You know, it's incredible that code trapped atoms is even a, a nice workbench for cosmology or for... Um, uh, uh, fluid mechanics, or statistical mechanics, or field theory, or many others, but including condensed matter. And people has been observed many interesting facts related to many body and condensed matter using those systems, and I think uh, is a nice opportunity to see how we are in this field. So thank you for accepting to speak, and uh, you have uh, 55 minutes of talk. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you, Vanderlei, for that very kind introduction. Of course, what you didn't say is that I'm known for talking too long, and that's why, uh, of course, we've had a very uh, uh, strict uh, description of the, uh, the time for this talk. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about ultra-cold atomic gases as a new condensed matter system. So in a certain sense, I'm trying to merge two of our, uh, uh, our commissions together. Uh, and uh, before I start, I want to uh, mention 
the, uh, the permanent members of my group, Gretchen Campbell, Paulette, Trey Porto, and Ian Spielman, who all do things uh, that are related to the topic of this, uh, uh, of this talk. And I also want to uh, acknowledge the people who, who give us money, and I also want to advertise the, uh, the Joint Quantum Institute that, um, uh, in which we work that's joint between the University of Maryland and the National Institute of Standards and Technology with su the support of the Laboratory for Physical Sciences. And uh, for the last uh, 10 years or so, we've been studying coherent quantum phenomena in both atomic uh, molecular and optical physics and condensed matter physics. So it's really appropriate, uh, the topic that I've chosen today for the work that uh, we have uh, at the JQI. And there's lots of opportunities for uh, study and research at the JQI. So if anybody's interested in that, uh, look us up on the web. Okay, so ultra-cold atomic gases as a new condensed matter system. So what are the uh, challenges that are addressed by this uh, uh, claimed convergence of uh, atomic and solid state physics. Well, one of them is the quantum simulation of Hamiltonians that are important in condensed matter. One of the things that's rather interesting uh, is that you can have extremely simple Hamiltonians that you hope describe some kind of a condensed matter system. And while the Hamiltonian is very simple to describe, it may be quite difficult to solve. And uh, sometimes, uh, an approach to this is to make an atomic system that reproduces the same Hamiltonian as opposed to reproducing the condensed matter system, but reproduces the Hamiltonian that one hopes describes uh, the condensed matter system and see what happens with it. There are new and different opportunities for measurement and control in atomic systems compared to condensed matter systems, and we'll see just what I mean by that in a little bit. Uh, also. Uh, looking at a problem from the perspective of atomic physics and looking at the same problem from the perspective of condensed matter physics can all often give you a, uh, a complementary uh, way of looking at things uh, that, that can be useful. And then finally, uh, the atomic systems can provide new kinds of condensed matter systems that don't really occur in nature. Well, what are the uh, atomic uh, tools that we use to, uh, uh, to study problems that are relevant to condensed matter. Well, one of them is the creation of quantum degenerate gases. Uh, so this means Bose-Einstein condensates uh, or Fermi gases at temperatures below the Fermi temperature. Uh, that's one of the tools. Another one of the tools is optical lattices, and I'll say a little bit more about each one of those. So what is an atomic gas Bose condensate and how do we make it? Well. We produce it by laser cooling and by evaporative cooling, and it's typical, uh, although not universal, that it might have many atoms on the order of a million. Now, of course, for a condensed matter physicist, a million atoms may not seem like a lot, but for an atomic physicist, a million atoms is a lot. Uh, and the important point is that if it's a Bose condensate, then these atoms are all in the same quantum state. That is, they're in the same internal state, and they're in the same state of center of mass motion. The physical size of these objects is often macroscopic. That is, on the orders of 100 microns or even more, uh, which is to say many optical wavelengths. If you're young enough, you can see something that's 100 microns across. Uh, so I really think that it's, uh, it's, it's quite mi uh, macroscopic in that sense, and in the sense that there are lots of atoms. And the atom-atom interactions can be made negligible or they can be made significant depending upon uh, the details of the circumstances and the time scales that you work on. In many respects, a Bose condensate is a gas at absolute zero, but it's not really at absolute zero, and that often is an important feature. Okay, that's Bose condensates. Degenerate Fermi gas is just the same thing, except with fermions, so they're not all in the same state. Uh, what about optical lattices? Well. Uh, if I've got a two-level system uh, coupled by some kind of an optical transition and I shine light onto the atoms that uh, constitute that two-level system, then there will be a light shift. Uh, I'm shining it in an off resonance, so there's very little absorption of the, uh, the light, but there's a shift in the energy of the light so that the ground state shifts down and the excited state shifts up. 
And now if I take two of those laser beams and counterpropagate them so that they interfere with each other to make a standing wave, I have a periodic structure in which the intensity changes sinusoidally in space, which means that the potential that the atoms feel changes sinusoidally in space. So these atoms uh, move in a periodic potential that is created externally. We call this an optical lattice. So it's sort of like uh, electrons moving in the lattice formed by the ions of uh, a solid crystal, but it's not self-organized. It's imposed from the outside. And it's possible because of the different dependence of the light shift and of the, um, the photon absorption rate, it's possible to make this uh, uh, potential essentially a Hamiltonian one, that is one that doesn't have uh, any dissipation or decoherence. Now how can we compare the uh, behavior of optical lattices to the behavior of uh, crystal lattices? Uh, well, what I'm going to do is emphasize the ways in which optical lattices might be better than crystal lattices. There are plenty of ways in which they're worse. <laughs> um, the optical lattice is essentially free of any dislocations or impurities, although it might be possible to add defects, uh, and the depth of the lattice isn't perfectly uniform, but the lasers that make these things are so coherent that there are essentially no defects in these, uh, in these optical lattices. The atoms that move in these optical lattices can be either bosons or fermions. We don't really get a choice in condensed matter. The electrons are always fermions. There are no phonons in the traditional sense. Uh, and that's because we're imposing this lattice from the outside with very coherent lasers. In a solid, phonons are vibrations of the crystal lattice. Well, that simply doesn't happen in our case. So we don't have any, uh, any phonons in the traditional case. We can vary the lattice constant because we don't need to uh, make a lattice by having counter-propagating laser beams so that the period of the lattice is half a wavelength. We can send the the, the lattice beams in at an angle so that the lattice constant is stretched according to the, uh, the cosine of the angle, and uh, we can make uh, any lattice constant we, we want upwards from uh, a few hundreds of nanometers. The potential is exactly known. When we shine the light on the atoms, we know exactly what the light shift is. So we don't have to make approximations about what the nature of the potential is and use all these uh, well-beloved uh, approximations like muffin tin potentials uh, that are, are used in condensed matter, we know exactly what the potential is, and it's a very simple one. It's sinusoidal. Uh, and the lattice dimensionality and the nature of the crystallography is something that we can choose uh, uh, among any of the, uh, the lattices that are, that are possible mathematically. We can even have quasi-periodic uh, lattices just by putting in the right kinds of laser beams, we don't have to rely on nature for giving us these kinds of structures. So this illustrates how we can change the dimensionality of our optical lattices. If we use two counterpropagating laser beams, then we make a 1D lattice, which is essentially a stack of pancakes, which is to say a stack of 2D systems. Uh, if we use uh, uh, two pairs of laser beams in a plane, then we make a 2D lattice of tubes, which are 1D systems, and if we combine these things, then we make a 3D lattice, the standard uh, uh, space lattice of, uh, of condensed matter physics, a lattice of, of zero-dimensional systems. Okay, so that's the optical lattice. So let's talk about putting a Bose condensate into an optical lattice. So let's imagine that we start with a Bose condensate. Uh, I'm not gonna tell you the details of how we make it. We make this thing cold enough and dense enough that it Bose condenses and we cool it down to the point that we can hardly tell that there's anything left but Bose condensate. So for many practical purposes, it's a gas at zero temperature. And we hold it in something like a magnetic trap, and then we turn the trap off typically. So now we have this condensate sitting there in space. Of course, it'll fall if you wait too long. We can sometimes hold it up by uh, applying anti-gravity fields. But uh, what we want to do is apply an optical lattice to it. So we apply this periodic uh, potential to it, and it separates uh, this condensate into an array of pancakes. And we can think of each one of those pancakes as being a miniature Bose-Einstein condensate. And if we do this uh, uh, rapidly enough, but not too rapidly, 
uh, then each one of these condensates will be phase coherent with all of the other condensates. And uh, uh, we now uh, can imagine what happens if we release uh, these atoms from the optical lattice so that the uh, atoms in each one of these pancakes can interfere with all the, uh, the atoms in the other pancakes. So here's a schematic picture of what that looks like. Here's uh, the atoms held in the optical lattice. Then we imagine turning the lattice off so that all of these things can interfere with each other. And the reason I've drawn it this way is to emphasize this is very much like what happens if I have a diffraction grating and shine a laser in onto the diffraction grating. What gets through each opening of the diffraction grating is uh, coherent with all of the light that comes from all the other pieces of the diffraction grating, and they interfere with each other to produce a diffraction pattern. And so what happens if we turn the lattice off and just allow it to expand freely for a certain length of time, it will form a diffraction pattern. And that's what we're looking at here. This is the zero order diffraction. This is the minus one order, the plus one order. And these things are separated by uh, a momentum that corresponds to the uh, the reciprocal lattice momentum of this lattice. So uh, what's happened here is that uh, the kind of, of thing that in uh, condensed matter physics we might think of as being Bragg scattering from a, uh, a regular crystal or in, uh, in optics as uh, diffraction uh, from a diffraction grating, here by virtue of the interference of all of these different uh, uh, miniature condensates, we get this uh, diffraction pattern. One way of thinking about it is, is the following. What we have here is a wave function that is periodic in space. The momentum space wave function is the Fourier transform of that. And if I take the Fourier transform of something that's periodic in space, I get a function in momentum space that has features that are periodic in momentum. And those features are separated by what we call the reciprocal lattice vector. So that's one way of understanding how uh, this uh, diffractive result happens. Now here I've redrawn it a little bit. If we imagine that this was light coming into a diffraction grating, it would diffract into a diffraction pattern. What it really is is a Bose condensate in an optical lattice that we then release, and over time you see this diffraction uh, pattern forms uh, uh, and spreads out just as it would in space with a diffraction uh, pattern. Okay. Um, now, in order to understand what's going on, we're going to adopt the same kinds of mathematical and theoretical tools that are common in condensed matter physics, which is to say we're going to use block states and band structure to uh, understand what's going on. So let's just have a, a quick review of block states and band structure. Uh, a block state is the, uh, the eigenstate of uh, motion in a periodic potential. And the nature of a block state is that it's the product of a function uh, called u that is periodic in the lattice spacing times a phase factor, which looks very much like uh, a free space momentum eigenstate. But uh, the wave function, of course, is not an eigenstate of momentum because it has this, this u function uh, in front of it. Uh, but because of the uh, similarity of this uh, part of the function, this exponential phase factor, to uh, a free space momentum uh, eigenstate, we call this quantity Q uh, the quasi-momentum of, the, um, uh, of, uh, of this block state. Now, if I, so those are the, the eigenstates of the periodic potential. If I ask for what the eigenenergies are, I get a picture that looks like this. And you've seen this picture uh, at the beginning of many uh, textbooks on, uh, on condensed matter physics. Uh, what we're looking at is something that mostly looks like a parabola, except for the fact that at certain places there's a gap in the parabola, an, uh, uh, an energy gap, and those energy gaps occur at uh, the edges of what we call the Brillouin zone. Uh, the Brillouin zone um, is, that is the edges of the Brillouin zone are halfway to the next reciprocal lattice vector. So the reciprocal lattice vector is here, and halfway to that is here, and that's where we're, we get uh, uh, this band gap. Now, where does this band gap come from? Well, I've mentioned uh, 
uh, I mean, it just comes from solving Schrodinger's equation, but there's another way of thinking about it in the context of, uh, of uh, atomic physics. I've called this the extended zone scheme because there are lots of ways of describing and, and graphically representing this, uh, uh, this band structure with, with the band gaps uh, that exist. This is the one in which we just continue uh, the quasi-momentum to higher and higher quasi-momenta and then just uh, uh, continue the, the eigenenergies uh, for each of those, of those quasi-momenta. But one of the things to, to remember about these block functions is that uh, because of the periodicity of these functions, if I change the, the quasi-momentum by a reciprocal lattice vector, it's like multiplying this by e to the i times 2 pi, which of course is 1. So that means I can add and subtract reciprocal lattice vectors at will, and I've still got uh, uh, essentially the same block function. So now let me do that. Let me add and subtract reciprocal uh, lattice vectors, and then we get what's called the repeated zone scheme. So here's that original uh, parabola with its band gaps, and here's another parabola just like it that has simply been shifted over by one reciprocal lattice vector. Now, the reason for the band gaps becomes more evident, because every place that there is a level crossing between two of these curves, we know that in quantum mechanics, whenever there's a level crossing, there will be uh, an anti-crossing as long as there is some kind of coupling between the two states. And that's why we get these band gaps. Well, where does the coupling come physically? The coupling comes from what we call Bragg scattering. If I have an atom in an optical lattice, which is represented by these two counterpropagating laser beams, and the lattice is moving to the left with what we call the recoil velocity, the velocity that it gets if it has the momentum of a single photon, then that puts the atom at the, uh, the point of the level crossing. It puts the atom at the edge of the Brillouin zone. And when it has that velocity, it can resonantly absorb a photon from this laser beam and emit it into this laser beam, thus conserving energy, and reversing its momentum, thus conserving kinetic energy. So this is why there's a level crossing at that point. But of course, if there's coupling, and here's the coupling, then there's a, an anti-crossing in which these two states end up being mixed, and we get a, a, a band gap that is proportional to the strength of this coupling. So looking again at that uh, repeated zone scheme, we see that uh, uh, anti-crossing opening up here, and that is one of the ways of understanding where does the band gap come from uh, in condensed matter physics. Now, this is a, a cartoon. Here's an actual calculation of an atom in a really modestly deep optical lattice. Five uh, recoil energies, a recoil energy being the kinetic energy associated with uh, one uh, photon's worth of, of recoil. This is an actual calculation. You can sort of see that there was a parabola there. Uh, it's harder to see here. but. This is an extremely small depth lattice. It's easy to make a lattice much, much deeper than that. So even with a lattice this deep, you'll notice that uh, we've changed the structure from being parabola-like to being nearly flat in the ground state and then being nearly sinusoidal in the first excited state. And if I go to just a slightly deeper lattice, about three times deeper, on the scale where I can see the first three states, the ground state is perfectly flat. The next excited state looks like a perfect sine wave, and only in the third state do I see something that, uh, uh, that bears some trace of, the, uh, of, the, of it being um, uh, a parabola. Okay, so now let's think about the behavior of atoms moving in these kinds of, uh, of potentials. Uh, what we want to do is to think about what happens when we put an atom into an optical lattice and give it uh, a momentum so that it's moving relative to the lattice. And the way we're going to do that is not by shooting atoms into the optical lattice, but by starting with a Bose condensate where the atoms are essentially motionless and then applying a lattice which itself is moving relative to the laboratory where the atoms are at rest. And then we're going to go into the moving frame of the lattice 
and, uh, and ask what is the behavior of, of the lattice. Well, how do we make the lattice move? Well, it's easy. Instead of having uh, two counter-propagating beams with, um, uh, with the same frequency making a standing wave, we have two counter-propagating beams, one of which has a higher frequency and one of which has a lower frequency. Well, why is this a moving lattice? Well, uh, imagine that I'm an atom uh, and I'm moving uh, in that direction. So if I move in that direction and I look at that laser beam, I see a Doppler shifted up. And when I look at this laser beam, I see a Doppler shifted down. If I move at just the right velocity, so that the Doppler shift up of this one and the Doppler shift down of this one make it look like the two laser beams have the same frequency, then in that moving frame, I have a standing wave. So that's the velocity at which the lattice is moving, and that's the, the, the frame in which I want to work, the frame in which the lattice is not moving, but the atoms now are moving because the atoms are at rest in the, uh, in the laboratory frame, or at least they were at the beginning. So what will happen? Um, well, okay, so this is how we produce a single block state. If I want to have an atom with a single value of quasi-momentum, this is how I do it. Now let's talk about what the behavior of these atoms is. Well, one of the things I want to know about is the group velocity of the atoms. Now, the group velocity uh, uh, is just the derivative of the, uh, of the energy with respect to the momentum, or in this case, with respect to the quasi-momentum. Now, um, remember that the lowest band in a deep lattice is flat. So that means the derivative is zero, so the group velocity is zero. So that means that in the moving frame of the lattice, the atoms are not moving when the lattice is deep, okay? But if the lattice is shallow, then uh, as we've seen, uh, it, the, the dispersion curve, the energy versus momentum curve, just looks like a parabola in free space. That means its energy is Q squared over 2m. We take the derivative of that, and the group velocity is Q over m, which is just the ordinary velocity, P over m. So that means that in a weak lattice, the velocity of the atoms is the velocity of the lattice, or the negative of the velocity of the lattice. In other words, a weak lattice doesn't do anything to the atoms, and so if you move with that very weak lattice, it looks like the atoms are moving in the other direction because they're at rest in the laboratory frame. So those are the two extreme uh, uh, circumstances that we might have for applying such a lattice. And this cartoon just emphasizes that. If I have a deep lattice, then the atoms are trapped at the bottoms of the potential wells, and they're dragged along by the lattice, so their velocity with respect to the lattice is zero. And if, um, if the lattice is, is extremely weak, then, they just, then it just washes over the atoms without doing much of anything to the atoms at all. And then the, uh, the group velocity is just the velocity of the, uh, of the lattice. So now, given that perspective uh, about the way these, uh, these atoms behave, I want to invite you to imagine a scenario in which we turn a lattice on and then move it and ask what do the atoms do after we turn the lattice off. So in order to make uh, it easy to think about this, I'm imagining the lattice as being a kind of conveyor belt. And I'm imagining that inside the conveyor belt are some sort of actuators that allow me to turn on some corrugation, which is equivalent to turning on the optical lattice. So here's uh, the conveyor belt, and it's flat, which means there's no optical lattice, and it's not turning. Uh, it's not moving, so the velocity of the lattice is zero. Now I turn on the lattice, and so the atoms are going to go into the bottoms of the, uh, the potential wells, and now I turn on the rollers so that the conveyor belt is moving the atoms along, and what we expect is that if the lattice is deep enough, then the velocity of these atoms is simply going to be the velocity of the, uh, of the conveyor belt, and uh, so the atoms are just going to be dragged along with the conveyor belt, and if suddenly I turn off the, uh, the optical lattice, the atoms are going to keep on going at the velocity of the lattice, right? Well, let's do the experiment and find out. So, uh, we put the atoms into the optical lattice. Here's the, the uh, sequence of events. Uh, we, uh, at some time zero, we turn on the optical lattice. We, while the, uh, the, the lattice is on, 
we increase its velocity so that the, uh, the lattice is moving and presumably the atoms are being dragged along with it. When we reach some final velocity, we suddenly turn the lattice off and then we take an image of the atoms to find out how fast they're going. And here's what happens. So if the lattice is not moving, we get a diffraction pattern. So this is the momentum of, uh, of the atoms in this direction, and this is what happens when the lattice velocity is zero, and you've already seen this picture before. It's just a diffraction pattern in which you see the zero order and the first and, uh, and minus first uh, uh, order of the diffraction pattern. On, uh, on my screen, I can see the, the plus and minus second order, but uh, it's pretty dim. Okay, now as we move the lattice, what happens is that that whole diffraction pattern moves over uh, in momentum with the velocity of the lattice, so that's not surprising. So the whole, uh, the whole picture moves as we increase the velocity of the lattice, so when the velocity of the lattice is uh, one uh, uh, reciprocal lattice vector, then we've got a symmetric diffraction pattern centered around one uh, reciprocal lattice vector, which used to be the uh, uh, the first order diffraction, but now it's become something that looks like the zeroth order diffraction because everything's been shifted by one reciprocal lattice vector. So this is just what we expected, right? No surprises. Now I want to do something that's almost the same thing. So here's our conveyor belt, uh, just as before. And again, just as before, we turn on the optical lattice while the conveyor belt is uh, is at rest so that the atoms are trapped in the bottoms of these potential wells. Now, just as before, we turn on the optical lattice and accelerate it until it reaches some velocity. And now we're going to keep it going, keep it moving at that constant velocity. And while it's moving at that constant velocity, we're going to slowly, adiabatically, turn off the optical lattice. So the only difference from the previous uh, uh, experiment is that we're turning the lattice off adiabatically instead of diabatically. And now I'm inviting you to guess what the answer is for what the final velocity of the atoms is. In the previous case, the final velocity of the atoms, the average velocity of the atoms, was the velocity of the lattice. And now this is a multiple choice question. Do you think it's the velocity of the lattice? Do you think it's zero? Because zero is a nice round number. Um, do you think it's somewhere in between? Don't know or none of the above. So now I'm asking you to vote. How many people think it's the velocity of the lattice? A show of hands. No one? Oh, a, f a few people, a few people, good, good. What about zero, this nice round number? Okay, we've got uh, more for zero, excellent. Okay, something in between zero and the velocity of the lattice. Okay, we've got a few for that. How about don't know? Now, I want to remind you that this is a single particle problem. And every condensed matter physics, physicist will tell you that single particle problems are dead easy. Okay, well, it wasn't so easy for us when we first did this experiment either. <laughs> Okay, how about none of the above? Do we have anybody for that? Okay, there's, uh, there's at least one uh, for none of the above. Okay, let's look at the results. Because, of course, we did the experiment. We didn't know what was going to happen. Um, okay, so here's the, uh, uh, the outline of the experiment. Uh, at some initial time, you turn the lattice on. Then you slowly ramp up the uh, velocity. We keep the velocity constant while we ramp the lattice down. Okay. And here is the result. When the lattice velocity is anything between zero and the edge of the Brillouin zone, the final velocity of the atoms is zero. So those of you who said zero really had something going. How can that be? Haven't these atoms heard about Newton's laws? I mean, they're moving along and we turn off the lattice, but they don't they, they come to rest when we turn the lattice off. But if we exceed the, uh, uh, the velocity of the lattice exceeds um, the, um, the edge of the Brillouin zone, that is half of a reciprocal lattice vector, then the velocity jumps to a full reciprocal lattice vector and stays that until we pass through uh, one and then get to the next Brillouin zone where it jumps again. So 
The correct answer was none of the above, because it depends and it's quantized. These, uh, these atoms always have uh, essentially the same velocity, except for all this noise, and, uh, and it jumps suddenly when you cross the Brillouin zone boundary. So what is going on? Well, what is going on is Bragg reflection. So think of it this way. When we start with an atom here, uh, this is the, uh, 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 the energy dispersion curve as a function of momentum. When we accelerate the lattice, in the lattice frame, it's the same thing as uh, applying a force to the atoms, and that changes their quasi-momentum uh, according to Newton's law, that the, uh, uh, the rate of change of momentum is equal to the force. And so that means that the atom moves up this curve. Now, if it stays on this side of the reciprocal lattice vector, then it goes up here, and then we keep it there, and then we adiabatically turn it off, and it changes into this curve, which means that in the lattice frame, it's moving with the, uh, the velocity equal to the opposite velocity of the lattice, and then when we transform back into the lab frame where we made those measurements, the velocity is zero. On the other hand, if we cross the Brillouin zone boundary, then we're on this curve. And when we adiabatically turn off the, uh, uh, the lattice, then we're on this parabola. And when we do the transformation back into the laboratory frame, it's moving at twice the recoil velocity or one reciprocal lattice vector. Another way of thinking about it is that the um, uh, atoms are accelerated to the edge of the Brillouin zone. They brag scatter at that point, reversing their velocity, going here, and then get accelerated again and then reverse their velocity and get accelerated again. And that is what's known in a different context as block oscillations. So we can think of this acceleration, this stepwise acceleration of the atoms as being block oscillations. So what are block oscillations? Just what I said. Imagine that I had electrons in a crystal lattice and I apply an electric field to those electrons. They will start to accelerate. And according to the theory of block oscillations, they will accelerate until their velocity matches the velocity that will be Bragg scattered by the lattice, at which point they will be Bragg scattered, which reverses their velocity because the Bragg scattering changes the velocity by a reciprocal lattice vector. And they were halfway to a reciprocal lattice vector when they reach the edge of the Brillouin zone. They'll be Bragg reflected and then they will continue to accelerate and when they get to the edge of the Brillouin zone again, they will be Bragg reflected. And if that happens, you see, the electrons never go anywhere. And so if that was what would happen, you would expect that when you applied an electric field to a metal, there would be no current flow because the the electrons would constantly be Bragg scattered before they could get very far. Well, that's not what happens when you apply an electric field to a metal. You do get current, and that's because the electrons scatter off of phonons and off of lattice uh, uh, impurities and off of each other, and uh, it messes up this perfect process of, of block oscillations that uh, you would predict in the simplest case. It's extremely difficult to see block oscillations of electrons in a solid state material. People have done it by making super lattices and making them extremely cold and extremely pure. But with cold atoms, it's so easy to see it that we use it just to warm up in the morning before we do the real experiments. So here is an example. In fact, this whole story has been an example of how uh, something that is difficult in uh, condensed matter is really easy in cold atoms because of the different uh, opportunities for control and for measurement. The other thing that it shows is that looking at this problem from a different perspective uh, made it so that it was hard for you to guess what was going to happen uh, in what is really an extremely simple system. And then doing this kind of an experiment uh, gives you a different perspective about the way this, this, uh, this system behaves. Now, I want to emphasize, as I said before, this is a single particle system. It's really, really easy. And all I've been doing to um, here, well, there's uh, uh, just more about block oscillations. When I transform into the, uh, the lattice frame, we can see the block oscillations. Uh, but 
But the whole point is that uh, by using a familiar condensed matter model in the context of cold atoms, we see things in a different way. And uh, this particular problem, which is very difficult to actually achieve in condensed matter, is easy to achieve in uh, atomic physics and is something where we can easily see what the answers are when we think about it in the right way. So this is just to illustrate that there might be something interesting about looking at condensed matter physics problems uh, from a different perspective. But the real fun comes when we uh, make these things truly many body problems. So one of the iconic many body problems in condensed matter physics has to do with uh, what is called uh, the mod insulator transition. So uh, the mod insulator transition is uh, dependent upon interactions between the atoms uh, for this quantum phase transition. Now, what do I mean by a quantum phase transition? I mean a phase transition that is driven not by thermodynamic fluctuations the way most uh, phase transitions are, but is driven by quantum uh, fluctuations. Uh, and it's very difficult to see this transition in solids, and there, by, by which I mean it's hard to take a solid, change a parameter in real time in that solid, and see it change from a conductor to an insulator. An awful lot of our understanding of whether things are conductors or, ins or insulators is um, uh, is understood in the context of the mod insulator transition, but it's not so easy to actually see a material undergo that transition. So here's the idea. Now, it's not the same as the, uh, the way we think about it in condensed matter systems, because condensed matter systems are always using fermions, and here we happen to be using bosons. And the, uh, the model that we use is the familiar Hubbard model, but we call it the Bose-Hubbard model because of the fact that we're using bosons instead of fermions, which is the usual thing that one uh, uses for a Hubbard model. But what's the Hubbard model? Hubbard model is an extremely simple model that is used to describe condensed matter systems. And it only has two features. The idea is there's a, there's a lattice, and one of the features is what is the tunneling strength for going from one site to the next site? And the other feature is, what is the energy cost if you put two particles on the same site? That's all that goes into this model. There's only one band. Uh, we forget about all the excited bands. We forget about any details of what these wells look like, what the nature of the wave functions might be in those wells. None of that comes into this model at all. The only thing that counts is the tunneling uh, strength from one well to the next and the energy cost for putting two particles on the same well. And this kind of a model leads to uh, a prediction about whether a material will be uh, an insulator or a, uh, uh, or a conductor. And for fermions, it's believed that this model may explain high temperature superconductivity, but it's so hard to solve the problem for fermions that no one knows for sure. No one knows for sure even what the, the phases of the ground state is, that this, this, what the zero temperature solution to the Fermi-Hubbard model is. But we're talking about the Bose-Hubbard model here, which is somewhat simpler. Uh, but still pretty hard to solve if you're going to do a brute force uh, solution. We do know the following. We know that uh, when the, uh, the lattice is weak, so that the tunneling is easy between states, that we have what is called a superfluid phase, where the atoms move freely among the various sites. And we know that when the lattice is deep enough, and we have the same number of uh, particles as we do uh, wells, then we get an insulator with each particle stuck on its uh, respective well. And the reason it's an insulator is that the tunneling isn't strong enough to overcome the energy cost to put two atoms onto uh, a single well. So this atom, while it might like to tunnel uh, from here to here, it can't 
because of the energy costs and because the tunneling simply isn't strong enough. So when the tunneling is weak, which is to say the lattice is strong, then we get an insulator. And when the tunneling is strong, which is to say the lattice is weak, then we get a superfluid. And it's easy for us to vary these parameters in such a way as to go from uh, uh, the superfluid to the insulator and back, and we do it simply by changing the strength of the laser that's making this optical lattice, because that's the thing that determines how deep the lattice is and therefore what the tunneling is. It also has a little bit of an effect on the uh, interaction strength, but the major effect is on the tunneling. And so it's possible uh, using these cold atoms to see this phase transition. And that's illustrated here in uh, uh, some work that was uh, uh, led by Ian Spielman and, and by Trey Porto, in which I was privileged to, to participate. Uh, this side of the, uh, uh, of the slide is showing the superfluid phase, where the lattice is weak and, uh, uh, and the atoms tunnel freely throughout the, uh, the lattice, they're a Bose condensate, they're superfluid, and they're superfluid in the presence of this weak lattice. When we release the lattice, we get a diffraction pattern, and that's the diffraction pattern. And uh, this was done in two dimensions. Uh, there had been earlier experiments by uh, Emmanuel Bloch in Munich and uh, uh, Tillman Essinger, uh, at ATH in Zurich, these were, uh, were 2D experiments, and here you see a two-dimensional diffraction pattern. But as you increase the lattice depth so as to decrease the tunneling, that diffraction pattern goes away. And when the, uh, the lattice is quite deep, you don't see any diffraction pattern at all. That disappearance of the diffraction pattern means that the atoms are stuck on individual uh, sites, and therefore, uh, don't have any coherence with the other atoms. Another way of thinking about this is if we have one atom per lattice which is something that we can achieve in our, in our experiments, then the uh, idea of the uncertainty principle in number and in phase comes into play. We know that we have exactly one atom, so that means we have no idea what the phase of that state is, what the quantum mechanical phase is. And so there's essentially a random phase from one uh, site to the next, and that means that all quasi-momenta are equally populated, and when we release it, we just get this, this mess. Whereas here, when it's a superfluid phase, it's essentially one quasi-momentum is populated and all the different sites interfere with each other because they're all coherent and have the same phase, and we get this sharp diffraction pattern. Now we can look at that in more detail and see as a function of how deep the lattice is, uh, how uh, the condensate fraction, that is the part that has to do with the, the sharp diffraction pattern, uh, how it goes, and we see that it goes sharply to zero at a very specific point. And until recently, it was impossible to calculate what that point was. But before we did the experiments, some really clever theorists came up with some really wonderful methods for doing a quantum Monte Carlo calculation that, uh, in a sense, circumvented the difficulty of a brute force calculation, which is an exponentially difficult calculation, exponential in the number of lattice sites. They were able to do this quantum Monte Carlo, quantum Monte Carlo calculation, which essentially agrees perfectly with the, uh, with the experimental results uh, within the uncertainties. So if we had been a little quicker with our experiment, we would have achieved a, a result that could not have been calculated by uh, uh, condensed matter theorists. Instead, what we did was we supplied an experimental result that confirmed the validity of this new and wonderful uh, quantum Monte Carlo approach to, to calculating the Bose-Hubbard model. So, um, what else? Well, there is uh, a lot of, uh, of other work going on uh, on optical lattices and other condensed matter related uh, AMO physics at NIST uh, and in many other places around the world. Some of this work uh, 
uh, involves uh, quantum information and quantum computing because you can see this is sort of a natural uh, platform on which to do quantum computing. I've got these atoms trapped in an optical lattice. I know where each one of them is. I can manipulate their motion by changing the nature of the optical lattice or by changing things locally by shining in a laser beam on a particular lattice site. And so this becomes a very nice platform for doing quantum information. But more of the activity is involved in quantum simulation. In other words, taking a simple model, like the Hubbard model, simple to say, simple to reproduce in an atomic system, very difficult to calculate, and then just doing the experiment. And you might say, well, how is this different from anything else, uh, uh, any other experiment? Well, the point is this. We're not trying to just do an experiment on cold atoms. What we're trying to do is to take a specific Hamiltonian and see how that Hamiltonian uh, behaves. Uh, that is, how, what, what, are, what are the solutions to the behavior of, of particles, in particular uh, many, a many-body system, moving in the presence of that, uh, that many-body Hamiltonian. In a case where we can't calculate it or where the calculations are extremely difficult. So we're not trying, in this case, to mimic a condensed matter system. What we're trying to do is to mimic or reproduce as accurately as we can a Hamiltonian that might have enough physics in it to describe the interesting things that are going on in that condensed matter system. That's the idea of quantum simulation. Now, in this case, what we're doing is we're using uh, the Hubbard model because it's sort of the natural thing that happens. Now, we don't have to do that. There are other things that, uh, that we can do that aren't sort of the native Hamiltonian of atoms in an optical lattice, but this is where we're starting. Um, so groups all over the world are using uh, this and other uh, AMO approaches to condensed matter problems. I note that Debbie Jin is the one who pioneered the, uh, the use of ultra-cold uh, fermions. And one of the wonderful things that she was able to see, and I see this as one of the great triumphs of, of quantum simulation, was to see what happens as you go over the uh, Bose-Einstein condensation to BCS, bardeen cooper schrieffer uh, regimes for fermions. If the fermions are uh, are strongly uh, uh, attracting, then you've got uh, Cooper pairs and you have a BCS situation. If you change the sign of the scattering length, then what happens is that these Cooper pairs, which are not really like molecules, become real molecules. And those, a molecule of two fermions is a boson and a Bose condenses. And you can go smoothly from one to the other. And people have been talking about this for ages, but nobody had been able to do it. And now finally, because of Debbie Jin's work, and, and this was done in, first in her laboratory, you can go through this BEC to BCS crossover. And one of the questions was, what happens? And the answer is, perhaps disappointingly, nothing really special. It just goes smoothly from one to the other. It stays a superfluid the whole time. It's just in one case, it's a Bose condensate. In the other case, it's a paired uh, BCS superfluid. And the process is completely continuous. There's no phase transition. So what else? Uh, lots of wonderful things are going on in, uh, uh, in quantum simulation. Uh, in my own group, uh, uh, these people, who I mentioned at the beginning, Gretchen Campbell, Ian Spielman, Trey Porto, and Paul Lett, are all doing different aspects of quantum simulation. Among them, synthetic fields. So Ian Spielman developed a way of making uh, neutral atoms feel as if they are charged particles in a magnetic field, because charged particles in a magnetic field is a really important uh, thing to study in condensed matter physics. And using that same idea, uh, he's been able to induce spin-orbit coupling, not the spin-orbit coupling of atomic physics, but the spin-orbit coupling of condensed matter physics, where there's a coupling between the linear momentum of electrons and, uh, and their spin. Uh, 
uh, a superfluid gas uh, in a circuit is something that Gretchen Campbell has pioneered. She makes rings of superfluid atoms and introduces Joseph's injunctions into them. And this is a simulation of uh, a superconducting circuit, but with atoms and, uh, and superfluids. Instead, uh, uh, Paulette is looking at uh, spinner quantum phase transitions. Trey Porto is looking at uh, super lattices. Uh, they're all looking at topological matter in one way or another, and uh, the future just looks, uh, looks amazing. We're going beyond the Bose-Hubbard model. Uh, our, one of our dreams is to solve the, uh, the Fermi uh, Hubbard model and find out whether uh, high temperature superconductivity is explained by that. Uh, maybe we'll get a better understanding of Majorana fermions. And so the conclusions that I leave you with is that cold atoms and optical lattices are an interesting uh, system that are uh, in a real sense, a new kind of condensed matter system that doesn't exist in nature, especially when the atoms are bosons. This isn't something you get in nature. And we can do all kinds of wonderful things. And I want to end by remembering Debbie Jin, who is the one who opened up the whole field of fermions for us and who died long before her time, just about a year ago. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Bill, for keeping time, and we have time for questions. So and, and because we've got so much time for questions, and because, as you all know... Not too much time for questions. We have five minutes for questions. No, 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 no. we've got ten minutes. Look, look, look at the clock. Look at the clock. Anyway, the point is that uh, just as, as, in, as last night, everyone who asks a question will get a prize. <laughs> so, what do we got? <laughs> yes. Uh, have you done uh, these block oscillation experiments with, in the presence of interactions? Have yeah. You, you didn't present any data? No, part? I didn't present any data, uh, I, but I knocked over your water. Um, so, uh, of course, the interactions are there. And what we find is that the interactions mess up the block oscillations. So uh, when we use uh, these bosons, and, and if you don't say tune, you see, we can tune the interactions by changing the magnetic field for a lot of these atoms. So we can make the interactions zero, and then you see lots and lots of block oscillations. But if you don't, then the block oscillations dephase. And I, you're right, I didn't show you any of that. But you can also do it with fermions. And if the fermions are cold enough, then the interactions turn off naturally because of the symmetry. And then with fermions, you can do lots and lots of block oscillations as well. So, so yes, and we've seen the fact that, that, that interactions certainly do uh, uh, decohere the block oscillations, just as you would imagine. I have one question, Bill. Sure. Uh, what about phonons in those lattices? We yeah. know that uh, phonons is a very important ingredient in condensed matter and in yeah. periodic system. Uh, right. You're so, moving the whole lattice, but this is like shaking the whole metal. Yeah, and that's not going to do it. So one yeah. of the ways in which you might be able to engineer phonons is to superimpose onto the lattice an additional periodic structure and move it. So this would sort of have the effect oh, of... Oh, you have to produce kind of... Yeah, phosphate. the kind of thing that you have in a real lattice where you have a kind of a wave motion yeah. of the position of the... Um, of the lattice sites, you can impose that by adding an additional field onto the lattice at a different uh, uh, optical frequency so that you don't have uh, a beating, but just uh, uh, Im imposing ripples. And then you, you, but as far as I know, nobody's actually done that yet, but I think, I think it should be possible. Yes, and you get a card. <laughs> uh, ah. So you don't include phonons when you talk about BCS state. What's the coupling for, for Cooper pairs? Right, right. So we don't have the electron-phonon interaction or the analog of the electron-phonon interaction. But remember, the elect what does the electron-phonon interaction do for you in BCS? It creates an attractive interaction between the electrons. So what we do is we create an attractive interaction between the fermionic atoms directly by contact interaction. So it doesn't have to be an electron phone inter interaction. As long as there's some attractive interaction, then we can get the, the Cooper pairing. And that attractive interaction can be made really strong, which is what we think happens in, um, 
uh, in high temperature superconductivity, but we're not there yet that we're really uh, seeing what would be the equivalent of high temperature superconductivity in these fermionic systems. But it's, it's, uh, we're engineering that attractive interaction directly by contact interaction between the atoms. And then back there. And uh, is it possible to define a uh, complicated optical lattice to do uh, better sim uh, simulation? Yeah, so, right, so can we make, we can certainly make more complicated interact, uh, optical lattices. Trey Porto, well he's not there anymore, but uh, Trey Porto makes super lattices. And one of the cool things that he does is, not only does he make a super lattice that is something that's more complicated, you know, than just a, uh, a simple periodic lattice, something that has structure within the unit cell, uh, he can vary that structure in real time. So he can do things like start with a lattice of double wells and then change those double wells into single wells. So he could start with atoms on each one of the two wells and bring them together so you get two atoms on one well and do all sorts of crazy stuff that you could never do if you were trying to do this in nature. So yeah, we're having a lot of fun with, with that kind of stuff. Thank you for a, an outstanding talk again. Um, so I just wanted to ask you one question. Um, many of us in quantum materials, some of us, actually, oh, thank you very much. Oh, gosh, I'm so happy. That's why I asked the question. Um, so many of us in quantum materials, some of us, have come to the conclusion that studying the actual Cooper pairing state isn't going to give you anything. We already have mean field equations that describe all the superconductors. But what's interesting in all these materials is all these quantum matter states, like you mentioned the MOT, the nematicity, pseudogap, stripes, all these weird. So I actually have come to the conclusion that understanding those states is the key. How much work is done to understanding this variety and the complexity and the comparison? Yeah, so I would say that is certainly the spirit in which we're looking at things. The idea being just what you said, that we've run out of mean field. That's not gonna, not gonna do it for us. It's gonna have to be true many-body physics, and true many-body physics is hard, and it's gonna contain all this kind of stuff. And so the things like the, the, you know, the, the, the Mott uh, state is all part of what we expect to get out of a Hubbard model. Now, it might be the Hubbard model isn't enough, but since we don't know yet, <laughs> <laughs> well, if that's the case, then we'll keep on going. But since we don't really know what the phases are, uh, then it's hard to know for sure. And, and your opinion, which may be a very good one, that the Hubbard model isn't enough, is not held by everyone, as you well know. <laughs> so we'll see. And what we're hoping is that the atomic physics community will have something to contribute to this pretty important question. I don't think we're going to be the ones that, uh, that finally solve it for good, but I think it's going to be a joint effort, and I hope that we'll have something to, to say about it. Yeah. If to look, uh, when you talk about uh, the moving of uh, atoms, uh, and uh, you say that it's some kind of as, uh, image of uh, electric field in, for electrons. So that uh, and in this case, uh, according to my understanding, it would be better to propose that it is uh, the changing of uh, this uh, potential energy. Not only to talk about that it's going up in this dispersion curve. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. One of the ways of thinking about this is uh, uh, if I go into the moving frame and I'm accelerating, it's as if that thing is just, just what you said, as if it's tilted because it's like applying a force. And uh, so that's a completely equivalent way of, of, of treating what I've, uh, what I've been describing. So you, you're absolutely correct. But it is more easy to understand those uh, terms. Well, you know, uh, what makes things easier or harder is often a matter of taste. So, uh, <laughs> so I don't know the answer to that. Okay, so uh, I guess we have to thank Bill for the nice uh, lecture.